my father would take me up on Saturdays every two weeks or so to his brother's uh, to get my hair cut. As his brother's side hustle, he'd cut hair on the side. It was a reason for him and my dad to go out after that, have a couple beers in the afternoon. But uh, they always had a cigarette hanging from their lip, Ella, like Humphrey Bogart, okay? Yeah. Sitting in a chair, go ahead, Donnie, take a puff. Yeah, go ahead, have a little glass of beer. Go ahead, take a swig, you're okay. It was a different world back then. They, mm -hmm. you know, the way things were done back then were certainly a lot different than it was now. So I've always been around cigarettes and uh, smoked myself. Then in the military, it became very, very common and uh, somewhat of part of our day, if you will. So I'm going to tell a little story about those things. And again, the quitting issue, my wife and I quit New Year's Eve, 1999, and we both quit cold turkey. As I was telling Sean, we never went back. I never had the urge to go back. And what was interesting is uh, for many years, I was a banker and I had my own office and I could had ashtrays and things. I never smoked in the bank. I never smoked during the week. During the weekend, pack or two a day. Okay. And it was just, I'd go, I'd get off on all Sundays, go right back, you know. And uh, so my quitting wasn't that difficult for me. I'm sure there is some, well, I know there's some withdrawal issues with nicotine. It's a chemical, it's a stimulant and all that. It just okay. didn't bother me. I didn't have the urge. I thought I would uh, when I was uh, having a coffee and meeting the morning paper somewhere. And boy, a cigarette really, you know, kind of was part of the morning and I just, it, I never went back to it, nor did my wife. That's very interesting. I, you'd probably be surprised at how many people I talk to that can just flip that switch. And yeah. once they make up with, you know, in their mind that they're done, then they're done. Yeah. So that's, that's amazing. And congratulations to your wife as well. And it definitely helps when you have that support at home and a partner that is quitting with you or promoting being healthy as well. So I'm sure that helped. Well, that is, that, that's the reason I quit. She wanted to quit. Um, and I knew that if I'm going to still smoke and she is not going to work that way. So we went in as a, as a tag team and it worked out very well for us. Welcome everyone to a season five bonus episode of The Scuttlebutt. I'm your host, Sean Hall, Director of Programming with the Veterans Breakfast Club. If you've been watching The Scuttlebutt for a while, you may notice at the beginning of the episodes, we thank our sponsors, one of them being Tobacco Free Adagio Health. Well, Tobacco Free Adagio Health is coming on the program today to talk to us and educate us about the dangers of smoking and the programs that they have to help you quit. They are dedicated to producing and preventing tobacco use and to getting the word out about those hazards of smoking and secondhand smoke. They're all about health. So they want people to quit and they have classes and nicotine replacement therapy and, and a popular quit line, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Uh, they also educate people, children especially, about tobacco use from cigarettes, cigars, pipes, chew, snuff, and other nicotine products like vaping, which vaping is, is really bad. I didn't know how bad it was. Well, listen to Diana talk today. It's bad. Finally, Tobacco Free Adagio Health advocates for public and private policies that ensure healthy places to live work, and play. You can learn all about what Tobacco Free Adagio Health offers at tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. Uh, they're a great organization, and they've been such a great supporter of the Scuttlebutt. We're very excited to, to have them join us. Also joining us for the episode will be uh, U.S. Navy veteran of the Vietnam era, Don Nimchik, who you've heard on the program before during our war music episode. Uh, we were excited to invite him onto the program as he was a smoker for quite a long time, ended up quitting at the end of the uh, the late 90s and um, quit cold turkey. So we talked to him about why he was smoking, uh, what he may have experienced after uh, he quit, and um, a lot of the interesting military terms that are, came up from smoking. But without further ado, enjoy this episode uh, with our sponsor, Tobacco Free Adagio Health. We thank them so much for sponsoring the program, and I think you'll learn a lot today. And we'll be coming back with a season six of the Scuttlebutt very soon. We hope you join us for that as well. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Diana Mahalchuk. I am with Tobacco Free Adagio Health. We are the regional primary contractors for tobacco prevention and control in the Southwest region and Allegheny County. We help people quit smoking. We help with policy work. We meet with legislators to advocate for funding for our programming. So I'm happy to be here and talk with you today. And you're a great sponsor here of the Scuttlebutt. So, you know, we've been really excited by uh, participating with you uh, for this season. And it's just a pleasure to have you on the program. And, and thank you so much for the support uh, of this podcast. Um, and Don Nemchek, for those of you who have been watching the podcast uh, before or listening to it, you may have heard Don's voice before. It is a voice for radio, I tell you that. Uh, but Don, welcome back to the Scuttlebutt and thanks for coming on. 
Well, thank you, Sean and Diane. I'm glad to be here today. I hope uh, some of my stories, anecdotes, and information uh, will add to the program today. And why we're going to be doing this today is uh, Tobacco Free, uh, like we said, is a sponsor of the, of the program. And what we wanted to do is have a podcast with you guys to talk about what your mission is, how you're getting people to quit, uh, educating people about tobacco use. And Don, he's going to be adding his veteran perspective to the conversation as he was a smoker back in the Vietnam era, eventually quit. Um, but there are some terms in here that I think our audience will, will be interested to hear. Uh, things like... Um, what is it, the smoking lamp? I'm, I'm completely green on what all of the terms are, but the smoking lamp is lit. Is that what one of them was? That's correct, Sean, uh, if you will. The smoking lamp was uh, very prominent in the early 1800s when they had sailing boats. Hmm. Sailors smoked primarily cigars and pipes because cigarettes and paper matches, uh, wooden matches, were not common. So the sailors, while they were at sea, actually had a candle in a lamp type uh, cover and it was hung upon the uh, bulkhead, the wall, if you will, and the smoke. The uh, sailors can walk by and light their pipes and uh, and uh, cigars. There was the smoking lamp was typically placed somewhere where it was away from gunpowder or anything else flammable. Fire. Because on a ship, fire is uh, the most uh, of high concern. Mm -hmm. Through the years, the smoking lamp term continued on even into my era, the, the Vietnam era, when I was on board a, a carrier aircraft carrier. Uh, you could hear over the 1MC, which is the broadcast uh, microphone uh, for the ship, it would come across the smoking lamp is lit in all authorized spaces. So a sailor can go ahead and smoke within his berthing area or where his workspace was. However, uh, when the smoking lamp was out throughout the ship, that meant we may be taking on fuel, weapons, there's a hazardous condition, and the smoking lamp was out, meaning nobody smoked anywhere, case closed. And uh, those uh, traditions in the Navy have a reason for them. So primarily it was a safety reason. And uh, that term, uh, the Navy oftentimes is very traditional. And that term just stayed with us, the smoking lamp. There's no formal lamp on the bulkhead or the wall or whatever. It's just a term that was uh, used way back in the sailing ship days when there was in fact a candle used to light their, uh, their tobacco products. And smoking is really prevalent throughout the military. And I, I read something that even as of, I think, 2017, 38% of military members smoke. So obviously, tobacco-free, Diana, uh, you're very much about getting people to quit. I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of veterans, you might serve a lot of veterans in helping them to quit. Is that right? Yes, we serve all kinds of people. We actually had a veteran symposium uh, with women veterans in the last two years, um, it's definitely one of the part target populations for our initiatives. We have recognized that it is prevalent in the military for sure. Um, there's also a high number of people that have mental health issues that are smokers as well. I believe it's 44% of all people that smoke cigarettes have a mental or behavioral health disorder. And as you know, within the military, um, there's a lot of trauma that comes uh, from going to war and things like that. So it's often used as something to de-stress with, but as we know, it is a stimulant. It does constrict the blood vessels. It makes your heart race. So you're not really calming down. You're not really feeling better. You're just feeding into that nicotine addiction. Um, and why do you think the military members, other than stress, smoke, Don? I, I, you know, and, and part of it, I know, is the, the tobacco companies promote to military members. They, they, they have pushed their products into the military, as we talked a bit before recording today about like Lucky Strikes and what they smoked, you know, even far back as World War I, World War II. Well, I think a lot of times, uh, particularly it starts in basic training. A lot of times the fellows are younger, 18, early 19 years old. They go into basic training and uh, oftentimes the, uh, the smoke break was a punishment or a reward function. If you had a good day as a company and you marched well on the grinder and did all your things right, well, you were rewarded with maybe a 15 or 20 minute smoke break at the uh, end of your evening meal. If you didn't have a good day, that drill instructor may have taken that, uh, that uh, benefit away from you. And so you guys aren't smoking today. You guys uh, screwed up on the uh, drill field today and I couldn't get anything out of you. So basically it was a beginning of punishment and reward. Also, we've all heard the term, smoke them if you got them. And that was uh, often a, a common, uh, take a five minute knee, take a knee, take a five minute break, smoke them if you got them. But there's a 
extension to that. It was oftentimes smoke them if you got them. If you don't got them, do push-ups or pick up leaves or something like that. So a fellow would say, gee, these guys are getting a break and I'm still working. So uh, there was just that inducement to get on the, the uh, uh, cigarettes and uh, they were handed out regularly. I know you were interested in some of the terms that people may not be familiar with, but oftentimes you would hear the term opies. You would ask them, what kind of cigarettes do you smoke? Opies. Well, OPs were OPs, other people's cigarettes. You never bought your own pack. You always were bumming cigarettes off of someone else. Mm -hmm. and frequently, cigarettes were often referred to as squares. Hey, man, you got any squares? Well, that term was used early on because uh, after people rolled their own cigarettes, it was common just to buy store bots. And the cigarette paper was originally just a square piece of paper rolled up in, by a machine. So they got the nickname. It's more of an urban uh, term. Uh, give me, get me a pack of squares. So uh, those types of things are common in the military. It's the jargon. It goes with the smoking issue. But uh, I think the reason veterans are more uh, prone to smoke back in the day, it was then treated as a, uh, a method to uh, boost morale, number one, and or calm the nerves. Say, hey, buddy, why don't you take a break? Why don't you get a smoke? Took your mind off what was in front of you, what was perhaps frightening you, maybe the loud noises, combat, whatever. You took a, a moment back and you took a deep inhale and smoke the cigarette. Not good for you, but at that time, it may have calmed that nerves and eased the mind a little bit when it really needed it. With so many military members uh, smoking, Diana, what type of methods does Tobacco Free Adagio Health offer just to quit? So we have what's called smoking cessation classes that we do. Uh, we meet once a week, we plan a quit date, it's very important to, to have a schedule of how you're going to handle your quitting. So it's not something that is going to happen on day one. You want to prepare for it. You want to make sure that you've identified triggers that you may have. Um, you want to delay things. You want to find tactics that if you, um, as Don mentioned, having a, a smoke in the morning was a usual thing. You want to find something different to do instead of that. So if you're used to waking up and having a cigarette, maybe you wake up and brush your teeth immediately. Or maybe instead of having a cigarette with coffee, maybe you try having tea. Maybe that will curb it. So we try to teach these techniques throughout our cessation classes. We also offer free nicotine replacement therapy because some people are lucky enough to be able to quit cold turkey and not need the help but others suffer some of those withdrawal symptoms and we wanna aid in that as well. So we offer all of our services are free of charge. Um, once you complete our sessions, we also offer a $50 gift card so you can treat yourself for accomplishing, finally quitting. So yes, just a bunch of support and fun little incentives along the way. Members of my family had smoked when I was a kid and some of them tried nicotine patches and things like that. Uh, do those work? Is it something that uh, is still considered a, a way to quit, like nicotine gum and things like that? Right, absolutely. So the nicotine patch, it, it can work for some people. Some people I've been told have some crazy dreams from them. So there are different techniques that you want to try if you do experience any of those side effects. If you do have dreams with them, don't wear them while you sleep wear them you know, till you go to bed and then put it back on in the morning kind of thing. They also offer three different milligrams. So if you're on the lowest dosage of a nicotine patch and you're just still craving cigarettes, maybe you need to move up to a higher dosage. So you have to be careful as to what you're being prescribed and make sure that you have the correct amount to combat those withdrawal symptoms. They do also offer the gum and the lozenge. Those come in two different milligrams. And sometimes we might recommend that someone be on a patch and someone use a gum. So it depends on how many cigarettes they're smoking a day. Um, we've noticed with vaping devices, the nicotine content is much higher the mm. delivery than what you're getting in a normal combustible cigarette. So when you think about how someone smokes a cigarette, most of it's burning away. So really the body's only absorbing one to two milligrams of nicotine per cigarette. Now, if you take a device like a Juul, those Juul pods have 59 milligrams of nicotine in them and you're not wasting any of it. So it does not ignite and combust until it senses that you're taking a drag from it. So you're not wasting any of it. You're getting all of that nicotine. So that's why we're finding um, much higher 
uh, nicotine content is causing a more severe addiction in youth and young adults. So we have to get creative in how we address those nicotine replacement therapies in those that are using the electronic cigarettes versus a regular combustible. That is incredible. I did not know that vaping gave you that high of a concentration of nicotine um, whenever you take a drag off of it. Um, there's different therapies then for, for between if you're smoking cigarettes or, or vaping then. It depends on the person. Mm -hmm. We try to tailor um, any kind of nicotine replacement therapy dependent upon what the person is using. So if they are using vaping devices, we might recommend the highest dosage patch with a lozenge or gum. There are also prescription um, medications that can be prescribed for the nicotine replacement therapy. However, they don't provide nicotine replacement therapy. It's actually a blocker that affects your brain um, as far as the delivery of nicotine. So it does what the nicotine does for your brain, but you're not actually getting the nicotine. So that is something that's prescribed by a doctor. There's also an inhaler that can be used as well. So it all depends on what the person is using, how often they're using it. If someone's going through two Juul pods a day, that's the equivalent of two packs of cigarettes. But as I mentioned, you're not getting the full amount of nicotine from a combustible cigarette. So you have to be careful and you have to make sure that they're getting what they need so they can be successful in their quit journey. This sounds, I mean, I remember when I was in college, I, I smoked when I would go out to a party and eventually quit cold turkey as well, which I, I don't believe that I was addicted to it at the time, but I do remember like I smoked a marble red and almost threw up, it was so strong. Vaping, you're saying, is stronger than even that, just how much you're getting. Right. I can just give you a for instance here. We can talk about Joel again. So as you mentioned, you almost threw up from a Marlboro. Mm -hmm. Your eyes water, your, your, no, your, your nose might run, your throat will burn. That's your body telling you, like, this isn't good. I shouldn't be doing this. And that's the reaction you get with a normal combustible cigarette. Take Juul, for instance. Juul has something called benzoic acid that they use in their devices. And what that does is it numbs the throat and the nostrils. So you're getting a much smoother, cleaner hit and you're not feeling that resistance. So you're able to ingest all of it at once. And benzoic acid is very bad for you. And you definitely shouldn't be ingesting that, but it also makes it easier for, for people to get addicted because they're not having that, you know, eyes are watering or their throat is burning or they feel like they're gonna throw up kind of feeling from it. Uh, Don, it makes me think of back at your time, like, you know, Marble Reds were pretty strong when I was in college, but back in, in Vietnam, was there like a, oh, that's a weak cigarette or that's a really strong one. You know, was, did their guys like, like Lucky Strikes more than they liked Camel, like, yeah, it, it's a good point, uh, Sean. There was a pecking order of cigarettes, if you will. Uh, Marlboro, Marlboro Reds, they didn't have the light cigarettes back then. Marlboro Red, Winston's uh, with a the filter. They were the stronger cigarette, but it became very common for menthol cigarettes to be very, very popular. Cools, Salem's, uh, they were extremely popular. And it might go into what Diane is saying too. I think that took the ease of uh, that harshness that a Marlboro or a, uh, that type of cigarette would, would bring forth. And what was interesting though, the uh, uh, menthol cigarettes, Cools and Salem's, they were much desired by the local, the Vietnamese, the Filipino people. Uh, they, uh, uh, they craved those menthol cigarettes as opposed to the Camel or Lucky Strikes. And you know, I mentioned to you earlier on, one of the interesting oh, factoids about Lucky Strike cigarettes, if anyone's familiar with the Lucky Strike pack, it's a white pack with a red circle with Lucky Strike written in it. That's how we recognize it. However, in World War II, it started out as a green pack, an OD, olive uh, drab uh, cigarette pack. And it was uh, rumored to be that the war effort needed that green ink, okay, for the military cause. So Lucky Strike had a switch from having that OD green pack to the white pack, which we know today. So uh, there was always something going on with the war effort. And of course, cigarettes were so common if you've seen some of the old movies with the USO shows and, and some of the other uh, Hollywood Bowl type of things that uh, was going on. Everyone was handing out cigarettes. The cigarette company gave them away, thinking that's their patriotic duty. They had an underlying reason, of course, too, is to promote their cigarette brand and get these guys hooked on it. But I don't really think that was the thought in, 
in, the, in World War II. In Vietnam, I think it was a little bit different. The, it was a younger group. A lot, oftentimes those guys just began to smoke whenever they were deployed overseas or, or on a ship, et cetera, uh, for numerous reasons, boredom, morale, being part of the group, whatever. But uh, it was interesting because there is that pecking order of cigarettes. A lot of times, uh, guys didn't want to smoke the non-filtered camel, Lucky Strike, Paul Malls. They would say, oh, man, you have a uh, camel. Let me go see the other guy. Maybe he'll have a cool or a Salem for me. So, yes, there was a pecking order of cigarettes. What I find interesting is that when Lucky Strikes changed from that green to red, it, doesn't it resemble the, the Japanese flag? Yes, very much so. The, uh, uh, the white and uh, the, 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 uh, the rising sun, if you will, in the middle, what that circle was, it, that's a very good point. It did represent the... Uh, uh, Japanese insignia, if you will. I don't know if that was ever a fact. I never read or heard anything like that. But Lucky Strikes had their own distinctive taste because their brand was they're toasted. They toasted the tobacco to give mm. it a unique flavor. Camels were the unique Turkish blend. That's why they had the, the camel on, on their logo, on their cigarette pack. So there's always something advertising, marketing going on with all these cigarettes. And of course, we all know Marlboro as the uh, Marlboro man, the, the symbol mm. of America, the a uh, guy riding on his horse with a cigarette hanging out. So uh, I think their marketing campaigns were very strong and obviously very effective. And that's a really good point, this marketing campaign, because it was very much synonymous with smoking in, in America and like, you know, the, yeah, the Marlboro Man and all of these things that look cool. And, and you know, if you if you were cool, you were smoking and all the cool kids in my high school would be smokers. And and I remember even up through, you know, early 2000s, I'd work at a restaurant. There was still the smoking section and all this. So, Diana, when when did we move as a society past the idea of like everybody smokes smoking sections? This is cool. Now we need to stop. And, and where did the health scare sort of come in that pushed us to say we need people to quit because we need people to be healthier? So. I think it took probably about 40, 50 years to really see the long-term health effects from smoking. And there was a change where um, we, we get our funding from the Master Settlement Agreement, which a bunch of states came together in 1998, and they sued Big Tobacco mm -hmm. for funding. So every year they provide states with funding for prevention efforts, for cessation efforts to have a free quit line and to be able to send nicotine replacement therapy to people for youth prevention programs and things like that. So I think once it was the largest uh, civil action lawsuit in history. And I think once we really saw the health effects from cigarette smoke and how many people were suffering from it, I think they really got it together and started putting the word out about it and funding programs to educate people. And that's the scary thing about vaping nowadays is everyone that is vaping today is the guinea pig. We don't know the long-term health effects from vaping devices. So, you know, we can tell you what, what's gonna happen with cigarette smoke, secondhand smoke, thirdhand smoke, but we don't know the long-term effects from vaping yet. So that's, that's a scary part. And how difficult, I mean, obviously it, it can be more difficult for some than others to quit. And Don, we mentioned a bit before, I believe we started recording, was that you quit cold turkey. Um, did you have any symptoms whenever you quit and, uh, and why did you decide to quit? Uh, uh, no, I did not have any withdrawal symptoms. I didn't gain a bunch of weight. Um, I wasn't uh, famished, I, uh, did, nor did I compensate not smoking by overeating or, or substituting chocolate or something else like that. It's just, I quit. And uh, it, it uh, uh, was effective for me. And, and of course, I had the support of my wife and vice versa. We supported each other. But uh, no, I didn't have the, the uh, uh, symptoms. However, uh, why did I quit? Again, mostly to support my wife uh, and her uh, quest to quit smoking. And she didn't have any really adverse symptoms either that, uh, that some people say, oh, if you're going to quit, you're going to gain 40 pounds. You're going to eat chocolate all day and all this other stuff. We just, uh, neither one of us had that issue. So uh, perhaps we're unique or maybe we have a little bit more discipline inside us, but um, no, we didn't have those common symptoms. And interesting what Diane was saying about the marketing of the cigarette companies and that big settlement. And we mentioned, Sean, there's that movie that is out, thank you for not smoking. And the heads of the tobacco industries were in front of Congress and telling some pretty good uh, fibs about uh, nicotine is not addicting. We have no idea the health benefits or the health 
risks to smoking. And it's, it might be something that the audience may want to take a look at. Again, the, the, uh, it's, it's not a documentary. It's kind of a, a movie based on the true stories of thank you for not smoking. How long does someone, I mean, I guess it depends on how long they've been smoking, but how long till they see their health improve? Um, I know my sister smoked for quite a long time, eventually quit, thankfully. Um, but how long till your lungs start to heal and your body starts to like come out of that? It's immediate. So mm -hmm. within an hour, your blood returns to your oxygen levels and that's all normalized. Your carbon monoxide levels drop. Um, within 48 hours, you're able to breathe better. Within um, just three months, your sinuses, your the, the way that you smell things and taste things all improve, which could also be why some people gain weight because things actually start to taste better. So you're actually tasting things the way they should taste and eating more of them because you actually enjoy it. Um, but the best part is that within 10 years, your chances of developing lung cancer drop to that of a non-smoker. So within hours, your body starts seeing positive effects and your lungs start healing from it. Now, I'm not gonna lie and say that it's all rainbows and, and you know cherries on top from the beginning. You're gonna be coughing up that gunk in your lungs probably for months, mm -hmm. but getting it out and you know not smoking is, definitely what you want to do. It's going to be what's best for your health. So it's going to get worse before it gets better as far as, you know, getting rid of the junk that's clogged up your lungs. But in the long run, you're definitely making the right choice. John, did you have any friends of yours when you came out that sort of just continued smoking to this day? And have they tried to quit? Uh, the answer is, did I have people within my circle that continue to smoke? Yes. And did they try to quit? No. Uh, a lot of them, old old school guys uh, uh, that were going to be smokers uh, forever. And uh, you try to encourage them to, uh, hey, man, did you quit smoking? I don't see you smoking anymore. And I would explain to them, yeah, I quit because of the health reasons and, and you know, with my spouse and things like that. It's, oh, oh, good for you. And they'd fire one right up. So to answer your question, I, I continue to be around people who smoked and uh, uh, didn't see any idea for them to quit with full knowledge of the health risk. And, as a veteran, I utilize the VA system for my health care. I'm always asked by my PCP when she sits down and talks to me, uh, were you a smoker? Did you ever be resume? Do you want to have a cigarette? And I keep, you know, I mentioned, boy, it's been since 1999. I have no, no reason to smoke. But there are plenty of fellows, veterans in particular, who will continue to smoke. I'll give you a good example. My uncle, uh, my uncle was in the Seabees in World War II. He's a young guy. He's 19 years old. He's on Guadalcanal. He landed before the Marines because the Seabees build things. Marines blow him up. So uh, he was in the uh, heat of uh, some pretty nasty stuff in uh, World War II. And I went to visit him on in his last days. And uh, first thing he wanted was uh, he was bring me up a couple packs of camels. OK, and I always say, I always say, Uncle John, you're still smoking these humps. That's what we used to call them humps because of the camel camel back. I says, John, you still smoking these humps, buddy? He says, look, let me tell you something. These got me through World War II. They'll get me through the rest of this. And uh, he quit. He, I mean, I'm sorry, he never quit. He smoked probably till his dying days. So uh, to answer your question, there are some people that are just going to be hard nosed like that for a lot of reasons. In his case, it was an emotional support for him. And mm -hmm. of course, he was probably addicted to the nicotine as well. Dana, do you find that some people continue to smoke for any reasons other than stress? Like, you know, that, that emotional support that that um, that like I had it with my coffee and my my newspaper in the morning, you know, what type of triggers do you do you see? So absolutely, we see uh, people use it as emotional support. Um, mm -hmm. They feel that it helps them calm down when they're stressed out or angry. Um, and then it becomes a part of their routine. So reading the newspaper, drinking coffee, smoking a cigarette, the drive to work, smoking a cigarette in the mm -hmm. car. For some, some reason, the car is definitely one of those places where people struggle. And I don't know if it's because they need something to do. So we try to offer supports um, instead of smoking in a car. So if you're going to get something to drink, maybe drink it with a straw or have a lollipop in your mouth or something like that. Just that sort of oral fixation of like, I need something. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And I definitely preference the straw in your drink throughout the day. So 
And then again, like I said earlier with coffee, some people coffee and their cigarette just go together or they're on break at work and they always walk outside and have a smoke with the smokers and, Mm -hmm. you know, change up your routine. If it, you know, if you drive to work the same way every day and you have that cigarette, maybe take a different route and try put popping gum in there or a lollipop or something like that, or a hard candy or something. If you go outside and you smoke with, with friends at work, maybe take a walk instead, especially with the weather warming up and it's going to be a lot nicer out. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe not take your break outside with them, take a break separate from them and, and, you know, do some reading or whatever you need to do. We all, we definitely try to offer different things, different avenues to take instead of smoking. So Mm -hmm. Whichever that may be, however we can help, um, we try to tell them to drink water, to delay, um, you know, put it off. Just keep putting it off and maybe you just won't need it at all. You went this long without it, you know, just keep putting it off. Get rid of ashtrays, get rid of, you know, lighters and things like that that are going to, you know, make you think, oh, I should light up a cigarette right now. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of little tips and tricks that we try to offer support with. And again, we have to tailor it to the person. So everyone is different and everyone's going to react differently. But like I mentioned before, our cessation programs, you don't quit on day one. You actually quit on week four. Mm -hmm. So all of those classes up until then are in preparation for that quit date and making sure you're prepared. You have your NRT if that's how you decide to quit. But we want to make sure that you're prepared and ready to go. Uh, Of the different methods of smoking, um, between, you know, pipe, uh, cigars, cigarettes, vaping, what would you say is still the the most prevalent among those? I would say that vaping has become the most popular uh, way to smoke. Um, Cigarettes have kind of declined over the last 10 years. I would say that with the pandemic, we've noticed um, smoking t- had a little uptick, but it's mostly the vaping devices and you know them coming in fruity flavors and things like that that are appealing to the younger youth and young adults, um, and I'm sure the military as well. You know they have something that's a sour patch kids flavor. I mean that's going to draw someone's attention. So I would definitely say vaping is definitely been the most popular. There's still um, smokeless tobacco that that people are using that has kind of stayed the same um, over the last 10 years. I would say the smoking went down, vaping's gone up. Diane, do you think the cost of cigarettes uh, contributed to somewhat of their decline? Because cigarettes now are well over $7 a pack. Back in my day, particularly when we were at sea, you could, you could get a carton for a dollar. And uh, it, again, the cost of cigarettes now, I find, I look at them when I see the billboards, I say, man, who in the heck's smoking at seven, eight dollars a pack? And perhaps that contributed as well. I would say it certainly could have contributed to that. For someone like yourself that could quit cold turkey and wasn't didn't have that strong addiction where they needed nicotine replacement therapy, I would say someone like yourself would probably look at that and be like, I can't spend 10 bucks a day on this. This is not worth it. And they would quit. But the people that have those strong addictions, they're looking for the deals. They're looking for the buy two packs, get one free. Um, And then even with the vaping devices, you see all kinds of deals and steals all over the place for those as well. So unfortunately, I wish it would curb everyone's, you know, habit, but it doesn't. Um, And they're continually raising those taxes because the government wants more money from it. And unfortunately, that addiction wins out in the end. And how can someone contact Tobacco Free and start to get on some of these programs? So we do have a website. It's tobaccofreeadagiohealth.org. You can visit our website, find out all about our programming. We have programming for youth, young adults, older adults, all you know, demographics, walks of life. Uh, We can help with policy work. We can help, um, again, with the cessation and the the free nicotine replacement therapy. We can um, do counseling. We can go in and do presentations. We can come to work sites and, you know, do cessation right there on the job. We can Mm -hmm. also offer just little presentations or, or even quit line information. So if you visit our website, um, you can contact us for more information. I would be happy to share my email address with your listeners if they want to contact me directly. 
It's D Mahalchik. That's D M I H A L C I K at Adagio Health, A D A G I O Health, H E A L T H dot org. That's great. And you do have a, a free quit line as well, right? Absolutely. You can contact 1 800 Quit Now. They have cessation counselors on there. They will send you free nicotine replacement therapy to your house. They will complete five counseling sessions with you over the phone. They'll do it through email, through texting, whatever is convenient for you to help you quit. Don, you've been uh, a non-smoker now for oh, about over two decades. Uh, are you happy you quit and, and how do you feel today? Oh, absolutely. I'm happy I quit. Again, it was a, a habit that came upon us, and um, I'm glad it's behind me, if you will. And it's a health issue. Uh, knowing, as Diane uh, aptly put it, uh, what it does to your, what it does to your body is uh, is devastating. So uh, I just don't want to be part of that. I like being around. I like being part of the VBC and and all the things that we do. So uh, smoking just uh, uh, just never come back to me. And I don't I don't judge people, but uh, uh, it's a foolhardy thing to do from the expense alone, but what it does to your body and the cost to the medical system, you know, to keep, take care of people with lung cancer, et cetera, uh, what it does to uh, uh, infants, uh, if the mother smokes while she's pregnant, there's just so much that we've all learned about. And it, it's just a, a foolhardy thing in my mind. So yes, I'm glad I quit. And uh, I would encourage anyone who's interested in quitting to contact Diane's organization, our sponsor. They do a great job in providing not only information, but resources to assist you doing it. And sometimes it's just a matter of a phone call and getting the ball rolling that way. Fantastic. I want to thank you both for coming on to the Scuttlebutt to talk about this. Um, Diana, thank you so much for supporting the podcast and sponsoring us. Um, I hope that our listeners, anybody who is smoking that's looking to quit, will contact you through your free quit line or jump on. It was at tobaccofree.adagiohealth.com. Um, it's a great way to stop. And uh, uh, thank you so much for being a part, of, uh, a part of the podcast today. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. And thank you all veterans for your service. Thank you, Don. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you on the, on the podcast here as well. Uh, hoping to have you back on for another conversation. John, I look forward to it. And again, thank you for having me on today. Thank you. And to our audience, uh, we will be coming up with a season six of the Scuttlebutt soon. Please remember to like, share, subscribe, and ring the bell on YouTube so you are the first to know whenever we release new episodes on Monday. You can also contact me, Sean, S-H-A-U-N, at veteransbreakfastclub.org if you have any questions, thoughts, or comments. Um, or if you're looking to quit smoking and need to be connected with somebody, I'm happy to do that for you as well. If you have thoughts or you have suggestions for any upcoming episodes, love to hear those. And uh, thank you again for watching. And we'll see you again on another episode of The Scuttlebutt.